Welcome to ADHD is over, a new podcast on a seemingly old label that we're going to be peeling off. Join my wife, Tatiana, and I as we journey with our family, the Wyden family, through the land of confusing information. We're going to visit both sides and let you decide because the power is with you. Welcome to ADHD is over. Hey, hey, and welcome back to our podcast. It's more like a movement. And when I say movement, it's not a pretentious type of, hey, we have a movement. You know, a movement sort of create themselves, right? Well, often people want them to be created and then they create it, you know, it's like an avalanche, right? It starts with a snowball. The reason why I call this a movement is because it's beyond ADHD, you know, it's, it's a movement to shift our perspective, perspectives, right? The more, the better, not just around ADHD or mental disorders, but really it's a movement to change our perspectives around parenting. That's what it really all comes down to. You know, for years, my wife and I have been discussing this. And it always arrives at parenting. And this episode is not about parenting necessarily, although it's always there in the background, like a very powerful hum, a sound, almost like white noise, always there. This episode is called How Not to ADHD. And if you're just joining us for the first time, welcome. It either means you have an open mind or you're here to prove that what we're doing is quote unquote wrong. And either way, you're welcome. If you're here to prove that what we're doing is, as one expert has called it, harmful, shameful, then you're in the wrong place because we're not here to argue with you whose scientist is bigger or has the better studies. We have plenty of studies and experts that can hold their water with the side, the experts that believe this is a mental disorder, this is a neurochemical imbalance, this is genetic, blah, 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 the list goes on. If you're here for that, wrong podcast. We're not here to um, defend uh, our studies or to say we are the only side, the right side, the other side is wrong. No, we're here to complete the narrative because the narrative is incomplete. One of our experts has called it a false narrative. Well, I see this expert's point you know, when you've been doing research on ADHD for 40 years of your life and you started on the traditional, um, if you will, kind of a Ivy League type of education and um, the academic world kind of position and then you later find out that there's a lot going on behind the scenes that once you saw that, you needed to change sides. That expert, name shall not be mentioned here, it's not the point, that expert, you know, with years and years of, quote unquote, you know, working his way uphill, swimming upstream, fighting, per se, it's frustrating. And so that expert called it a false narrative around ADHD, the current narrative, a false narrative. We don't go that far because it's a heavy word, false narrative, especially nowadays in the age of fake news. What we feel is the right term is incomplete. Why is it the right term? Because when parents are looking for information on the web, they're always told, be careful. There's a lot of misinformation out there. Well, it's funny. Because while that's true, 
you know, there's a lot of garbage out there. We've read some stuff where it's just like it's not based on any kind of study or common sense or anything, or it's just ridiculous, you know, but everybody has a right, I guess, still to express themselves, you know, and to, to share what they believe is true. It's a bit irresponsible for us as sort of the world police of self-expression to say, well, that shouldn't be allowed that people can just express whatever they think is right because then other people will fall for it. To me, that is a very, very disempowering and irresponsible way to look at things. It does reflect, however, the kind of uh, society, the kind of society with lack of confidence, lack of, of uh, intuition, lack of responsibility that we've created. Because when we have to become the sort of policing force of like, well, let's protect the what we call vulnerable or stupid. It's really what we mean, stupid. But we, we say vulnerable. The ones that fall prey to these scams or these, you know, these misinformations. If we're coming from that place, first of all, it's not empowering. It's kind of like that metaphor, you know, don't give someone fish, teach them how to fish. And this is a little bit of a side loop. I'm aware of that, but I just wanted you to know that we stand for creating a future, a future of humans, of beings, children who are becoming adults, that can read any information and let it sink in, let their internal guidance system combined with research. Sure. Do as much research as you need. Some people are heavy researchers. I'm not, I trust my intuition and off I go and I learn my lesson and I recalibrate my internal guidance system. You've heard me talk about this. That's the kind of future that I believe will bring us more fulfillment as as a peoples, as a world of human beings versus the kind of human beings that are externally referenced and constantly need to research and constantly need validation from external sources to make their decisions. Why am I mentioning all this at the beginning of this episode? Because if you're here with an open mind, as I mentioned, you're either here with an open mind or with a closed mind ready to fight for your side, the other side, the current narrative. If you're here with an open mind, you've come to the right place because I first always like to lay down the basic commitment we have, and that is to shift perspectives, not to give tips, um, you know, coping tips or strategies. That's not why we're here. If you take a tip away, if we do mention a tip and we do once in a while, that's fine. Go ahead, try it out. See if it works. If it doesn't work, then it's not for you. Moving on, right? And these tips and these strategies and, and these insights are not misinformation. They're not made up out of thin air. Everything we say, you can either Google it, look it up. You can contact us. We'll get you information. We have interviews to back it up. We have experts, books, studies, PDFs, you know, discussions that were had. It's not out of thin air. It's not misinformation. If you feel it's misinformation, please write to us. Go to ADHDsover.com. Write us and have a constructive dialogue on this podcast or offline through email. We're open. We're not closed to that because we do believe that ultimately our commitment of making a difference for children, for the future of these children, is so strong that we are not blinded by any kind of interest group that is funding us or any kind of study we need to adhere to or any kind of side we need to please. We're here because we're committed to creating a space where we're in agreement in the world to changing the agreement from the current narrative to complete that narrative so parents have the full view so they can make informed decision decisions for their children, and we can all together create a future of human beings who are self-reliant, independent, strong, resilient, but mostly who are internally referenced, who can go to their internal guidance system 
and make great decisions and learn and grow and keep going and not be dependent on outside sources. So that's pretty much our commitment. So if you're here and you're ready to have your perspective shifted, great. Come along the ride. It's been about 10 minutes and we're going to have about another 20 minute discussion around what I mean by how not to ADHD. Okay, here we go. Ready? Let's do this. So this episode is inspired by um, a YouTuber, an ADHD YouTuber slash expert, Jessica McCabe, who has a TED Talk um, on ADHD. And she is a big, big activist in the space. She's done hundreds and hundreds of videos under the banner, How to ADHD. And look, she has a passion and a commitment that I respect and admire. She's done really well for herself inside of the context of having this thing called ADHD and coping with it. She's what we would call the side of coping. And we're not saying that in a negative way because coping for some people is a huge step forward. So coping is okay, but coping is hoping. We are in the camp or the community or the box called thriving. And when you're thriving, you can't be coping. Or I should say when you're coping, you can't be thriving. So the reason why I wanted to title this episode, How Not to ADHD, is because I wanted to kind of nuance a few of the things that not only Jessica in her videos talks about, but also other uh, experts in the coping camp. Let's just call it that for now. I kind of like that ring, coping camp. The coping campers often use statements that make me cringe. And I'll explain to you, first of all, what the statements are, but obviously what, what it means for me to cringe, because cringe could be when somebody says something that triggers me or that I disagree with uh, as a basic principle of morals or whatnot, political, blah, blah, blah. Yes, that's one, one form of cringe. But what makes me cringe a lot is when statements are made, but they're not nuanced. They're not looked at, you know, with the magnifying glass and going closer and deeper. Because when we're committed, let me just, I just want to get this straight, guys. If you're here listening from wherever, wherever you live around the world, first of all, fucking great. So happy you're here. So excited. Thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for sharing it. Thank you for having an open mind around this. Because we are ultimately committed. I am committed to making a difference for children that have been labeled or diagnosed with ADHD, with this so-called disorder labeled currently as ADHD, because it wasn't always. Hence, we always say it's made up, and it is made up. And we don't say it's not real. Well, we do say it's not real, but it's not that we don't believe that people don't struggle with these symptoms, these traits. We do believe the struggle is real, but as we always say, the in brackets, disempowering label doesn't have to be real. Struggle is real, label doesn't have to be, okay? Just so we're on the same page. Our commitment is to these children. And so when I say these statements by the so-called experts need to be looked at closer, that's why. We can't just throw out statements, general statements, that actually have been not debunked, I hate that word, but disproven that they're true. And we still keep, you know, these experts still keep peddling them forward and keeping them alive. So I'm just going to today, for the sake of this episode, use a few examples. I don't think we'll have time to go into too many, because as you can tell, 
I'd like to go a little bit deeper on things. Because that's where the perspectives get shifted, you know? It's like taking your mind on this adventurous joyride, a road you've never been on, to see what you discover newly. I did this actually this morning, just about half an hour ago, I got back. I took my Jeep up on the road that I normally don't go and I had a really interesting drive and it really felt like I was shifting my perspective on the environment that's around me, around the area where I live because I could see mountains from a different point of view and roads and cars and people and nature. So look at it that way. We are committed to taking you with each episode on this kind of adventurous new drive around your the neighborhood of your brain, of your mind, of your, pers- you know, what has formed your perspectives and your points of views in the past. And if you're along for that ride, yay, let's do this. First statement, something I heard in a recent video on how to ADHD, is that often what I hear are things like people with ADHD or some of these experts who have ADHD say, you know, we, us, the ADHDers, of course, deal with or have to deal with naturally with rejection, lots of rejection, more than other people you know, will encounter in their lifetime. And that's because we have ADHD. Now, at first sight, you may say, okay, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, you know, if you have ADHD, you, you know, get rejected a lot, can't make friends, you're kind of crazy. Teachers, you know, always put you in the corner and single you out and blah, 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 blah. Right? Yeah, makes sense. On the surface level, yes. But this is exactly how not to ADHD. Because this is actually brushing over some very important details, some very important research, some very logic, resonant evidence that you can let in. You know, we're we're very heart-based, as you may have noticed from if you've listened to other episodes. But that doesn't mean that we don't let things sink into our brain, our mind, and and let them make sense logically, right? Because when sometimes I hear a statement and if it makes sense logically, it clicks and I'm in. I can be very logical, very heady, but I can be mostly also very heart-based, which is what started this project. So let's dive in. So when these experts say, well, you know, because we have ADHD, you know, of course we have to deal with more rejection and it's because of ADHD. Well, I'm not saying that people who have been labeled or diagnosed with this so-called disorder ADHD don't have rejection in life. Of course they do. Now, side note, rejection, by the way, is very common in life if you're living on this planet. It's a thing we encounter. It's a a situation in life that will test our willpower, our resilience, our self-worth, right? The conversation around who we are and what we're capable of. So in itself, rejection isn't a bad thing. It could be listened to that way. Yes, of course. Who wants to be rejected? But when you think about it, the power, the true power of human being really is in the ability to be able to say, I just got rejected and that's okay. There'll be more opportunities. That wasn't for me. It hurts, but I'm moving on, right? Whatever that is, whatever comes our way, that we're supposed to deal with because it's in front of us. Why would we want to run from it or avoid it? It's like being pissed off at a flat tire. Well, 
yeah, you can be pissed off all you want, but you have a flat tire right in front of you. So get to work on what to do. Call AAA, change your tire. I don't know, use the foam that we used to put in the tires, whatever. But being pissed about it is not going to make a difference. Like literally, you have every right to be pissed. It just ain't going to make a difference, right? So why am I using that example? Because rejection is similar. When we get rejected, we can feel sorry for ourselves. We can be down. We can be insecure. We can be devastated. We can be depressed. All of these emotional states are a choice we can make at the time. Now, what they're trying to say is, oh, well, because if because of the ADHD, you're more sensitive to rejection. And there's now a um, new disorder. It's not too much um, research yet on it, but it's called rejection sensitive dysphoria. And supposedly, and this is kind of all sort of wrapped into a big ball of wax with my point here, that people with ADHD supposedly have this more than anyone else, right? And the point here is that I'm making, and I know it's super nuanced and it's very under the hood. I'm going into the very sort of fabric, the tiny fibers of this statement, because I'm tired of hearing experts brush over these kind of statements. Oh, it's because of ADHD. Now, back to rejection. What we're not looking at is all the factors that could contribute to someone who was labeled or just, you know, diagnosed with ADHD, having this rejection sensitivity or this issue with rejection. And it's not because they have the thing we call ADHD, which doesn't by itself, in itself, not exist as a thing. It's not a thing you can open, you know, cut someone's brain open and find it. It's made up. It's a label. It's a name for a set of traits that supposedly challenge someone in life to turn out or to be a, you know, good member of society or to be successful or happy or stay alive, whatever, right? So that said, if you don't have that thing that just by itself as a thing, right? Then when we say it's because I have ADHD, that's why I'm more sensitive to rejection. That's a, that's a cop-out. I'm going to say it again. It's a cop-out, and I know that could be triggering for someone. But really, really what we need to look at is if someone struggles with rejection, we need to look at the history of their emotional upbringing. Where are they at with self-confidence, self-love, right? All of that. Where are they at with resilience, believing in themselves, believing they can, especially believing they can. And here's the thing, what I said earlier, there's many factors that can shape us into these beings with lack of self-worth, lack of believe in oneself, lack of yes, I can, right? And one of the biggest factors is the disempowerment not only of the label of ADHD, but how a child or someone with ADHD gets treated, labeled, named. That's one factor of the factor, right? It's one asset of that factor. But the biggest one, and here it comes, and this is the core of the episode. The biggest factor in influencing a human being to create and foster self-worth in themselves is, or I should say the biggest thing in the way to do that, is the entire agreement, the baggage that comes from years and years, right? From, hist from the history of ADHD when it first began. It all 
comes downloaded with one word. When you hear ADHD, it's not just like, oh, 2021 mental disorder could also be a positive, creative thing. You're unique. Okay. That's not all that's coming at you. What's coming at you or someone who gets labeled with ADHD in that moment is an entire history a massive world picture around what that disorder is all the way back to when it used to be called, uh, you know, mischievous children or, uh, you know, my favorite is minimal brain disorder, right? All that gets instantly downloaded into the conscience. If it's, if it's a little child, then it's the parent, it's the parent that's then treating the child like a broken human being. It's then treating, you know, the school is treating the child like that, singling them out, troublemakers, need help, need to be supported. Oh, sorry, that child can't focus. That child is too much. All of, all of that, all of those actions and reactions after that label is dropped onto someone, all these reactions and treatments of children are not just because of that label in that moment. I'm going to say it again. It's the entire ball of wax, the history of this disorder. And it used to be called way worse when you look at minimal brain dysfunction. Can you imagine saying you have a minimal brain dysfunction and actually feeling good about yourself and being confident and really working well out in the world? No, it's impossible. You're going to look at yourself, even if you're strong, you're going to look at yourself as 80% of me is pretty good, but there's that minimal brain dysfunction of 20%. So I'm not really 100% kind of human being. So I'm always going to be less than. And that, even though I could go further, I hope you follow this because yes, it was a big loop here. But it's those nuances that we need to start analyzing and we need to start saying, are these words, these labels empowering or disempowering? That's it. That's how we split the hairs, the atoms, right there. Is it empowering or disempowering? And if the answer is, well, it's empowering because experts can... Da, 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 da. No, no, no. We're not talking about experts. We're not talking about a shorthand between doctors. We're not talking about a medical healthcare industry, standard terminology, blah, blah, blah. No. We have to start with the children in mind. Why? Because they're the, the young ones. They're the impressionable ones, the ones we are here to mold positively so we need to start looking at, is this label empowering or disempowering psychologically? And again, somebody could say like, oh, yeah, yeah, we've heard this argument before. The label is, is, could be disempowering to certain children. Again, that's not going deep enough. Like we got to cut the bullshit. That's not going deep enough. It's not, it's no longer fair to our, our children just to say like, well, yeah, well, I mean, the label can be disempowering, but you know, we also, there's a lot of positive things and blah, blah, blah. No, stop it. We have to cut it out. We have to realize the damage, the psychological damage, the autopilot damage, the, well, we don't think it really damages our children kind of damage from years and years and years and years of labeling the same, what they call disorder, the same traits with different names, one worse than the other. And finally, we think now we have sort of a milder version of it. No, it's still called a disorder. I mean, ask somebody, anybody, as a, as a little um, exercise for yourself, you know, you could do a man in the street. If I went out right now and I went to the streets and I would ask people if they would love to be in a relationship with a disordered person or have a disordered child, most people would say no, even if they're nice to say like, yeah, it depends. I mean, maybe I would adopt a child and help them out. Sure. There's those of us who are like ready to do the work, right? But most people will go, uh, no, not really. Why would I want to be with a disordered person? Now I could be way off the page here, my friends, but 
that certainly is the agreement out in the world. And we're still calling it a disorder. It's not a disorder. If anything, it is a set of traits, behaviors that show up due to the friction that a child has or a person has with his or her environment. And that is just something to work on in life. I don't care who it is and how they choose to work on it, but that's all it is. And now we can fire away and go ahead and label it, you know. Now we can pull out <laughs> the marketing hats, sit in a room and label it. But guess what? If we had children in the room, imagine having a room filled with experts, doctors, authors, but also children and their parents. And we ask everyone, what should we label this? What should we label this? What do you think they would say? Well, before I go there, I actually just wanted to read you something here. In 1966, the U.S. Department of Health, Education and Welfare, uh, together with the National Institute of Health, this is 1966, when the term minimal brain dysfunction in children was coined, and this is just one of the terms, right, uh, over history, over time, um, one of the ones that really stuck out to me because the dysfunction in the brain is a pretty solid medical term that you wouldn't question if a doctor told you this, right? So this is 1966. And so, you know, in terms of the labels, I just want to read you a few of the, uh, what they called uh, terms. It was 38 total terms used to describe or distinguish the conditions grouped as minimal brain dysfunction. Just giving you, I'm not going to read all 38, but for example, there's organic brain disease, organic brain damage, organic brain dysfunction, minimal brain damage, diffuse brain damage, neurophrenia, organic driveness, whatever that means, cerebral dysfunction, organic behavior disorder, right? Minimal brain injury. I mean, it goes on. And then there's hyperkinetic behavior syndrome, character impulse disorder, hyperkinetic impulse disorder. So you can see they really tried, here's, here's my favorite, primary reading re retardation. Seriously, primary reading retardation. Um, clumsy child syndrome. Perceptually handicapped. Conceptually handicapped. So, I mean, this is a document that you can find, I believe, on the internet. Uh, we have the PDF. It was given to us by our awesome uh, collaborator, consultant. Um, you can look this up. But I'm still in shock. It just gave me a little shock there. So imagine, so this is all coming from the experts, from the doctors, these sort of, we know better, you know, high horse, talk down to, to you parents, so you can fix your broken children kind of position. Because you would never in a million years, would you ever come up with these terms if you had young children in the room and you would ask them questions and say, what do you guys think we could call it? You know, what would be something to really describe what you're struggling with, but to be respectful of, of your being, of your soul? I'm going to say this one more time. It's not brain science, dear experts, to label challenges that a child has in life with some label that is empowering. That is not brain science. We can do this this afternoon in an hour. And if the whole system is willing to change, I guarantee you in 10 years from now, we will have a better world. We will have more empowered children and adults running this place. But it would take all of us to come to the table and sit down again. That's my dream. I do have a dream too, and that is that we do that. We change the label from disempowering to empowering, period. 
in the DSM, we can do this. Okay. So back to that, right? Imagine being in a room full of children and you're asking them, Hey, little Jack and little Beatrice names that came up. I don't know why. What do you guys think? You're, you know, eight, nine years old, seven years old. You're struggling with some stuff, with some homework, and you want to play outside instead of be at the school. And sometimes you don't listen to your parents and you do these impulsive things. We get it, right? You have challenges right now in this world to function, not only the way your parents or educators expect you to function, but maybe society sort of sees you as a little bit of an annoyance. Okay, what should we call this that empowers you? I guarantee you a thousand percent, none of the terms I just read, and I know this is 1966, but that's my whole, that's my point. All of these terms, all of these agreements, this dark cloud behind just the label, the four letters, ADHD, all gets downloaded into our psyche once that label drops, once it's an official, quote unquote, right, diagnosis, right? So the point here is that 1,000%, none of these terms that I just read you would ever come up and cross any child's mind to label it something so negative and disempowering. And negative is not, you know, hear me out. This is not me saying, oh, it's so negative to call a child, you know. Well, yes, but it's, it's deeper than that. Negative means disempowering. Because if you raise a child and you keep telling them that your brain isn't quite working that well, even if you say yet, it will soon, you are essentially brainwashing your child to believe that she or he is less than. That is a fact. When I say brainwash, I really mean that. You know, somebody recently told me like, you shouldn't use that word. And I said, well, when you, when you wash your brain, usually it gets clean, right? If you wash something, it's cleaner than before. So A, it's not a bad thing, but I used it in the typical sense that you are literally um, brain imprinting your child with this belief. Our brains are so malleable and can so easily form new connections. We are so impressionable, impressionable, especially young children, that if you tell them something five times a day, a few years later, that is a reality for them. That is not something you used to say. They no longer question that. It's just how it is. It's just how it is. We are like that. That's how advertising works. It would, advertising wouldn't work if we weren't that impressionable. It wouldn't work, but it works really well. Because if we're bombarded with the same information again and again and again and again by people we look up to, eventually it becomes a reality. It's no longer the thing that person said. It's now our reality. It's like a pair of glasses we're now wearing and we're not aware that we're looking through those lenses all the time. But that's how it is. So back to the children in the room, the terms they would come up with could be just like, you know, I don't know. I'm not saying those would then be the terms that we should use in the DSM or, uh, you know, for doctors and medical experts and so forth. No, we could, we could take the essence of their statements, the essence of, you know, if we really listen to them, if we make them feel heard and seen, we will get the essence of what they want to communicate. And then that essence, we can instill at our adult marketing brains put our hats on, our marketing hats, and label it in a way that makes sense for us, right? Yes, we can still do that. But the only difference there, notice I never said ADHD should be taken out of the DSM. I mean, I get that the DSM and the whole system, the, the medical insurance and, and uh, you know, everything is a system. It's a giant, giant system that is deeply rooted in our society. And it's just not realistic to say, make it go away. So keep the DSM, that's fine. But change the terminology of the 
so-called disorder. First of all, it's not a disorder. Don't call it a disorder. You know, if you want to call it a, um, uh, for the lack of better words, um, you know, if someone has a, a condition, right, call it a condition, call it a, a, you know, set of traits, set of symptoms, uh, uh, behavioral struggles, challenge, something that allows for the person to feel like it's just a hurdle in front of them. Like if you're running, if you're sprinting hurdle races, right? It's just the next hurdle in front of you and you're going to get over it. But it's not a fucking brick wall that says you have a disorder and you're going to fucking crash into this brick wall right now because that's where you end. Unless you get help. And that's another one of those brainwash labels, right? I need help. Well, first of all, it's okay to use to, to ask for help. Anybody. We've all needed help. We all need help. Help is not something, is not a sign of weakness, right? You know, the famous saying, uh, asking for help is not a weakness. It's not. It's actually a strength. It's a courage to say, I need help. Or I was listening to uh, Eckhart Tolle, uh, a quick video, Eckhart Tolle, German uh, philosopher and writer, uh, spiritualist, who was sharing how he'd spent some time with the Dalai Lama. And the Dalai Lama, impressingly so, often said, I don't know when people asked him questions about things he didn't know. He wasn't pretending to be the all-knowing, um, well, I think, or what I heard. No, he just said, I don't know. And there's power in that. There's power in this sort of uh, uh, admitting that, I don't know, you know? And so I know I'm kind of deviating here. I'm, I'm going on, uh, on a few more loops. But really, if we look at this kind of place, you know, th this, this place we've come to, where we have labeled children or adults, our focus is on children, with a disorder, which means, well, unless you use these therapies or these strategies or this medication or that, you cannot ever function in this world and be successful. That itself is a massive, massive imprint on the brain, the soul of a human being that will leave that person disempowered, that will leave that person to struggle. And now I want to close that circle to really have a hard time with rejection. But it's not because they have ADHD, quote unquote, that they're more sensitive to rejection. It is because the disempowerment that they've been continuously brainwashed with, it goes so deep that they literally cannot handle rejection because they have tried to build up resilience or have self-worth, but because all of this disorder and broken and treatment and help and not yet there and soon and maybe, but you got to cope and strategies and special ed and all this stuff is subconsciously, often not even consciously or, you know, out in the open, below the surface is weighing on them so much that it's just not fair to throw these terms around out there and say, well, it's because of ADHD, we have a harder time with rejection. I really hope you followed this. I know this was a long train of thought on this one statement. The next statement, I'll make it shorter, is the statement we often hear that because of ADHD, people have a higher chance of ending up in jail, right? Getting in trouble, drugs, jail, whatever. Same concept, folks. If you're still listening, use a lot of what I just said, right? The nuance to go deeper, go down into the fiber of this statement. It is not because of the thing that's made up called ADHD. And we really got to let that sink in. It is made up. 
because it wasn't ADHD when it was minimal brain dysfunction. It was around a similar set of traits, but the ADHD part wasn't, never was, never has been, never will be real. So when someone says ADHD is not real, people get triggered. Yeah, because they're not actually asking the question, what do you mean? They're literally thinking ADHD is a thing. Like it's like this, I don't know what you would see, what it would look like, but it's this like purple little mass that's growing in your brain. And because of that, you, you know, it's a thing, but it's not a thing. It's just not a thing. So when we say ADHD is not real, that's what we mean. It's not a thing. The traits, the struggle that you have, the symptoms in your life, the friction, that's real. I'm with you on that. Because I, myself, probably would have been diagnosed back then in the 70s, uh, 1977, 78, when I was seven or eight, a hundred percent. And I have been diagnosed now as an adult, you know, for this project to see what they would say. So I can relate. The struggle is real. Trust me. There's some of you that think, oh, you don't know what you're talking about because you, you don't really have ADHD. No, I mean, I've never been officially diagnosed for the record and, and you know, going to therapy and taking meds, but I know I do have the traits, the friction. I don't have ADHD because it's not real, but, you know, you get my point. So what I'm saying is those struggles, those frictions in the environment is what can cause someone, if they're not powerfully and lovingly supported by peers, parents, education. Yes, they could end up doing drugs and go to jail. Yes, but again, it's not because of the ADHD. That's a huge, huge little, it's a big difference to really look at it that way. It's the same thing with, um, I often hear that, uh, uh, you know, couples, married couples uh, are more likely to get a divorce because they have an ADHD child. And so it's kind of like the child is blamed on, you know, the, for the divorce. Oh, because we had a child that was, you know, has ADHD. Now we're getting a divorce. No, same thing. That is just a child that shows up with struggles, traits, symptoms that now parents are challenged to really look at themselves and their marriage and to really flip everything upside down and reduce the friction in the household to make it work. If they end up getting divorced, it's not because of the child. It's because the child challenged them and they couldn't handle it. It's that simple. In a responsible world where we are responsible for everything that shows up in our lives in front of us, everything that's here, we've created, we've manifested, we've attracted, or maybe even subconsciously or on a spiritual soul level, we've asked for it to show up so we could grow in contrast of it. That's called responsibility. It's here. It's mine. I'm going to respond powerfully. That's responsibility. Irresponsibility. It's not a negative word. It's just the absence of responsibility is when we blame others or external circumstances. Oh, because our child had ADHD. Now we're divorced. So then people say, well, that, you know, the statistics of divorce goes up with children when they have children with ADHD. Not fair to say. Not fair. Not nuanced enough to, for a new parent who just got their child diagnosed, who is on the fence, who has an intuitive feeling that this is all kind of not really a disorder and it's bullshit and medication is not the only way, right? If you're on the fence and you hear those kind of statements, suddenly you're off the fence and you're falling into the coping camp. And so we just don't think that's fair that not, o- not only the narrative is incomplete, but it's not nuanced enough. The statements aren't consciously explained and both sides are looked at. And that's why I wanted to do this, how not to ADHD. Because in the coping camp, these slogans, these myths are thrown around so quickly. And I love when they say, well, here's the myths around ADHD. And then they'll sort of go into, it's bad parenting. That's a myth because it's not true. Again, it's not nuanced enough. I've done an episode around that. You know, it's not nuanced enough. It's not fair to just throw these things around. To me, that's harmful. That's shameful. 
to use the words of one of the experts that uh, denied to be on our show or in the documentary and called us harmful, harmful and shameful what we do. But I would challenge them on the other side. This particular expert, also we found out, was talking about medication as the most effective thing for ADHD. And this expert was even a proponent to say, if your partner, right, as adults, if your husband or wife has ADHD, you might want to get on some meds too, just to get a boost so you can deal with them. While, first of all, wow, my mind is again blown when I just hear myself telling that story, even though I've heard it before, I've seen the video. Again, not nuanced enough. You know, way not nuanced. That one is 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 another podcast episode by its in itself, worthy of that, because only a person on medication, externally referenced and dependent, dealing, quote unquote, with their mate who has this so-called disorder ADHD, only that person would be a proponent of medication because they're on medication themselves. They're not responsible enough to take this on without external help. Now, you heard me say how asking for help is not a weakness and it's not a bad thing. Correct. But asking for help and being physically dependent on something like medication or years of therapy and actually just staying in the hope in the coping camp and never making it to the full responsibility and thriving camp that alone is being irresponsible so it really comes down to responsibility and you've heard me say this before as parents as educators as medical experts as authors can we be fully responsibility and responsible and own the fact that all of these heavy disempowering terms of the past, this dark cloud around the term ADHD or whatever terms it was before, like minimal brain dysfunction, can we own the fact that we've caused a lot of damage so far and it's time to change? It's time to at least, this is the minimal, <laughs> this is the minimum I'm, I'm rallying for is can we at least take responsibility that yes, maybe it's been disempowering and it's caused a lot of shit. And, but can we change the label to something empowering and start there? We don't even have to do away with medication right now. We don't even have to do away with special education or all the experts or all the therapies. I do think all of it needs a reform. But can we just start with changing the fucking label so that we don't do ADHD how we've been doing it so far because it's clearly not working? Hence, how not to ADHD forward would be, I guess, <laughs> a little thing to add to the title. How not to ADHD forward into the future? Well, Let's start with changing the label after we take full responsibility that the mess we've caused is the mess we've caused because we were the ones that caused the mess. Right? We could start there. How not to ADHD forward into the future. I like that. Wow. Today, guys, I know this was intense. If you're still listening, wow, you're really a brainy person and open-minded and and I thank you for, for taking the time to do so. I know there was many, many, many side little turnouts and side conversations and thoughts, but uh, ultimately I hope that I strung it together for you so that you can be present to the simple fact that ADHD as a thing is made up. That's not good or bad. That's just a reality. That's a fact. And when we start there, we get that everything else is agreement, words that cause agreement. And we've created an agreement for years, over a hundred years or more, we've created an agreement 
that this is a problem, a disorder, a dysfunction. And that in turn, in turn creates agreement in the children that they're broken, not normal, not 100%, bad kids, right? So it just trickles down, as you can see, into straight, imagine this fountain trickling down straight into the conscious and subconscious of a child, of a young child, giving them the sense that I'm not really good enough to make it in this world. I'm not really strong. I'm not really whole, right? And that is, again, circling back to when we say, oh, people with ADHD have a harder time with rejection. Yeah but not because of ADHD. Anyway, I'm going to leave it at this, wishing you a magical day wherever you're at. Just know beyond hope, there is a reframing that can be done with a declaration by you saying, for me, ADHD is over, or for our family, ADHD is over. What starts now is responsibility of us as a family, working on removing as much friction in life, in our family life as possible, so that our child feels safe, heard, seen, supported, loved. The right school is chosen, the right nutrition, the right exercise, and so forth, right? It's a lifelong process. That is how it starts, with a declaration, and then that work, right? First, Shifting the perspective, child's not the problem. Two, heal your shit, meaning parents start first. They heal their individual shit in life, whatever they need to let go of, whatever they need to work on. Then the marriage, need to work that out. Then you go into all the corners of, the, of life and the household that I've just mentioned. Number three, honoring your child means you don't try to mold them into something that you think is beneficial for them in the future, but you actually let them unfold and let them become who they are discovering and who they want to create themselves to be in the future. That's a new perspective. Let's try that for 10, 15, 20 years. And I will bet everything and anything I own that that result would be more positive, more empowering. That's why we do this podcast. That's why we do this documentary. That's why we're working on the book. Because with a simple declaration, what can be over for you and your family or your friend is coping, is lack of self-worth, is feeling broken, feeling not good enough. That can be over. That's what we mean by ADHD is over as a declaration. And you or your family, you can start thriving. Thriving. Who doesn't want to thrive in life? I definitely want to thrive. And I wish you to thrive. I wish this for everyone in the world to thrive. Look, there's always going to be challenges, hurdles. There's always going to be drama and trauma. But when we start to shift our perspective from coping to thriving, we are creating ourselves as fully equipped to handle such dramas and traumas. And therefore, we are thriving even when life is on the down. We are thriving because we're picking ourselves up and life goes back up, up and down, up and down. Thriving is just a thrust, the rocket boosters that we train ourselves to have so we can go on this roller coaster up and down, up and down. Anyway, enough said, Roman, cut it out. Much love to you, much power. Be back soon. We're going to, we've got so many great episodes coming. We just, uh, confirmed Peter Bregan. If that's a name for you, Peter Bregan is an amazing expert who's been rallying for pharma to stop poisoning our children. You'll hear more about Peter Bregan and from him on our podcast. Bruce Lipton is going to talk to us about epigenetics in April. We have more stories coming from people who turned out, even though they were labeled diagnosed, some medicated, some not. 
So yeah, come back. More info coming soon. We're just growing stronger. The camp is growing. All right, have a magical day and a magical life until next time.